Next chapter, 1995. It's called Second Chances. 1995, I am the commanding officer of SEAL Team 3. So this is a, uh, a fairly prestigious position in your career. It is like being a battalion commander in the Army. So I'm the commanding officer. SEAL Team 3 is in Coronado, California. And the story opens up, and I am holding what's referred to as a captain's mast. So when somebody has screwed up, the military has a very formal proceeding, and I, as the captain, the commanding officer, I'm in full uniform, the individual comes in, and in this case, it was an officer. An officer named Jeremy Carter. That's a pseudonym. Lieutenant Carter had gotten a DUI, and so he came in, and for an officer to get a DUI is not a good thing. And I, I was hard on him. I kind of threw the book at him. And, uh, and I remember afterwards, the command master chief, the senior enlisted guy in the command, came up to me and he goes, oh, sir, you were, you were pretty rough on him. You know that will end his career. Because as an officer, you just can't get a DUI. You can't be found guilty of a DUI. And I realized that. And I remember the master chief saying to me, man, maybe you should have given him a second chance. And I thought, I don't know. Well, the next day, I go up from Coronado, California to Central California, a place called Morro Bay. And Morro Bay is a place in Central California, and at the entrance to Morro Bay is something that looks like the Rock of Gibraltar. It's this big, large rock. And as I was driving up and kind of approaching Morro Bay, there had been a storm off, uh, off the ocean, and the waves coming into Morro Bay were huge. They were 20, 25-foot waves, and they were being funneled in by the bay by this kind of giant rock. So the waves would come, then they'd hit the funnel, and then they would get really large. And I, I remember thinking, well, you know, we're not going to get out through that surf because the plan, I was coming to observe a SEAL platoon that was getting ready to go on their final exercise before they deployed. And their exercise, they were going to go from Morro Bay in these two 33-foot rigid hull inflatables, big rubber boats. And they were going to go out through the surf, go down about 50 miles, come back in, go over the beach, conduct this mission over the beach, a training mission, and we would evaluate that and we determined whether or not they were ready for deployment. So I get in there and I'm thinking, wow, this isn't gonna go too well. So that evening, I kinda, I kinda bed down. The next morning, I was gonna get a chance to go observe the seals. Well, I get up in the morning, and as I'm making my way out into the bay, the seals are already you know, kinda doing some training, I see one of the rigid hull inflatable boats, the 33-foot boats, and it's positioned as though it's getting ready to go out through the surf. Now, the boats don't work for me, but I'm the senior officer. So I take a little Zodiac and I go over to the 33-foot boat, and I talked to the young lieutenant. I said, son, what are you doing here? He said, well, sir, we're going we're to go out through the surf. And by this time, we're talking 30-foot waves. I said, well, you're not going to go out through that surf. He says, yes, sir. He said, we've been trained in this. We were in Alaska, and we got this plan. When the surf comes through, we're going to kind of break around the side. And, uh, and I said, well, I don't think it's a good idea, but uh, give me a life jacket. I'm, I'm going along with you. And he said, well, sir, you don't have a you don't have a dry suit on, you don't have anything. I mean, if, if we capsize, you, I said, well, don't capsize then. So I strap in, and there are a couple other SEALs in the back, and, and there are, again, seven guys in the boat. And I'm thinking, okay, let's see, everything's looking good. They need to head off to the corner here. So all of a sudden, the helmsman guns it, and we head 35 miles an hour, and we hit the first wave, and it's a 30-foot wave, and we go straight up this wave, and we are literally airborne for four seconds because I'm in the back going 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Well, we hit in between the trough of the two waves, and the bowman, he falls out. He's, he's thrown out of the boat. And now we're, we're stuck in between these two waves, and the next wave is coming. Well, the coxswain does the right thing. He swings the boat around, but he guns it again because he's got to get to the face of the wave before it eats us. Well, he gets to the face of the wave, all right, hitting at 35 miles an hour. We go straight up this wave, and this time it's five seconds airborne in a 33-foot boat. And I'm counting one. Well, we hit, and now the boat goes dead. A few more guys fall out. We've got a couple of broken ribs, and now the wave of the day comes. And it's about a 40-foot wave. And it picks that boat up and just dumps us right on the back. Well, now I am trapped underneath the boat. And I am trapped, and I have this nylon line we call shot line that has somehow gotten wrapped around my neck. I'm unable to breathe. I'm trapped underneath this boat under a 40-foot wave, thinking to myself, so this is how it ends. I had been in the SEAL teams for 15 years. And part of the job is you always have these kind of near-death experiences where you just about something happens, but you manage to get out. But this time, 
I didn't think I was getting out. I am completely wrapped up. I am completely entangled in shot line. Somebody's weapon is wrapped around me. I'm underneath this boat. I've got no dry suit on. And I say to myself, I will never see George Ann, Bill, John, or Kelly again. People often ask you, when you're dying, does life move slowly? And the answer is, it did for me there. Everything was moving kind of slowly, and I'm thinking, this is it. And then, and I use the word, I think, appropriately, miraculously, I am completely freed. Freed of all the entanglement. And I shoot to the surface, but now I'm in the next set of waves, and I'm not going to make it. And I suddenly hear off to the side somebody screaming and yelling, Skipper! Skipper! And I look off to the side, and two seals are coming at me in a small zodiac. A small zodiac, about a, a, a 10 foot zodiac, and they're making headway towards me, and the next wave is coming. They swerve, pick me up. I don't even get a chance to get in the boat before the next wave comes crashing down, and they manage to pull me out just before the next wave eats us. Seven guys that day went to the hospital. Fortunately, we didn't lose any lives, but we did lose a $500,000 boat. The investigation, which took about another 30 days, showed that while our judgment wasn't great, you know, the expectation sometimes is for us to challenge ourselves, to, to assume some risk. The two SEALs that picked me up that day and two other SEALs who rescued another guy received the Navy Marine Corps Medal, which is the highest medal for valor in peacetime. Four years later, I had the opportunity to be on the promotion board for Lieutenant Jeremy Carter. Young, and as I had a chance to brief the board, I was able to con convince the board that this officer, in spite of his DUI, was a great officer, and he needed to be promoted. It was one of the first times in the history of the Navy that we have promoted an officer with a DUI. And the moral of the story is, once again, you'll have that opportunity to give somebody a second chance. Don't pass it up.